Well, hello everyone. Thank you for making it back from lunch. It was wonderful. I'm saving my food till later. My name is Keith Grimes and I am a general practitioner and I work in the National Health Service. And I'm here to talk to you today about practical digital medicine. So what is practical digital medicine? Well, practical digital medicine sits somewhere between what we've just heard about, the absolute cutting edge of medical technology, and what we're going to hear about next, which is about the implementation of diet and lifestyle medicine. And I've been practicing digital medicine as long as I can remember. I've been a GP for 20 years. And it's important to understand why I've been doing this. Now, we've been hearing all day today about the incredible advances of technology. It's a dizzying rate of change. But in my experience, health isn't moving in a dizzying way. It's moving really, really slowly. And why is that? Well, you know, we're dealing with life and death, so it makes sense that we take the right steps and we move in the right pace. But there are other safety-critical industries that are making this change, and they're doing it. So, so why can't we do this in healthcare? We, we've already heard one approach to this. But my approach is by just getting out there and doing it. Doing it safely, considering this, but doing this with, a, uh, with partnership with my patients. And today I'm gonna to give you four practical examples, so some practical examples in different areas to explain a little bit about what that means. And also by understanding this, what the future of healthcare might be. So we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence. We're gonna talk about virtual reality. We're gonna talk about genomics and we're gonna talk about the internet of things. So we're gonna start with artificial intelligence. So you've already heard people talking about artificial intelligence already. And uh, you may have even had some definitions. There's certainly going to be people in the room that know much more about artificial intelligence than me. And I'm a GP. I like to keep these things simple. So what is artificial intelligence? It's basically teaching computers to do things that humans can. And specifically, the cognitive skills, thinking, deciding, looking at objects and understanding what they are, listening to us and understanding what we're saying, all of these things. And we're in a world where the number of doctors isn't rising as quickly as demand for doctors. So how do we plug this gap? Some people think that we're gonna have an artificial general intelligence that's going to replace doctors. They say it's gonna happen in 10 years, it's gonna happen in 20 years, 50 years, whenever it is. But I'm interested in the components, because if you look at the components, they can help us right now. So one of the first components that you can look at is the work of a company called DeepMind. And I think DeepMind were referenced earlier on today already. Their mission is to solve intelligence. And they were acquired by Google back in 2014. You might have heard them in the news because they managed to train one of their artificial intelligences to beat a world Go grandmaster. Now, they've actually been working in healthcare. So they're already working in three places. At Moorfields Hospital, they're using their machine learning to do image recognition to identify the early stages of disease in retinal imaging. They're also working at the Royal Free, developing an app to allow clinicians to identify quickly the changes in blood tests that might indicate acute kidney injury. And they're working in the Royal Surrey Hospital and with Cancer Research UK to identify early changes in mammography data. Because it's so important to identify these changes early, and if we have, don't have enough doctors and staff to do this, machine learning can come and help us here. But again, I'm a GP. 90% of care in the UK happens in primary care. So I'm really interested about how artificial intelligence might work in my day to day. So I promise you some practical examples today, and the first one is a really, really obvious one here. I work in a general practice, and I prescribe. And every time that I prescribe medication for a patient, I have decision support. It tells me about what medications they're already on, it tells them about what medications they might interact with, and their allergies. And now, thanks to development of those systems, it's informing me about the best choices based on the best evidence or working within the NHS, the best cost decisions. This is happening already. And we're seeing chatbots, already mentioned earlier on about financial services. There's a chatbot called Wobot, W-O-E, Wobot. And what that does is that provides cognitive behavioral therapy to people that find it difficult to access mental health services. Publicly available tools have allowed me to write a chatbot. So I have a chatbot that assists me in the work that I do identifying the causes of red eyes, which is a common presentation in the urgent care center. And then you look at a company like Babylon. Babylon not only provide video consultations using an app on your phone, but they have an artificial intelligence that provides medical answers and triage questions to people, not only in the UK, not only in Ireland or Rwanda, but now to the estimated 1 billion users of WeChat. So you can see how 
practically, artificial intelligence is being used right now in components. And it's making my job easier already and helping patients in the future. It's augmenting my intelligence, not replacing me yet, at least. And next, we have virtual reality. Now, virtual reality is my personal favorite because I describe myself as a GP. I'm also a geek, and I'm a gamer, and I love this kind of technology. And maybe some of you look at virtual reality and think, well, this is only for gaming. And you maybe understand that because you might have seen that recent film from Steven Spielberg called Ready Player One, looking at people escaping a dystopian future into virtual reality. But this is a technology that's been around for a long while now. And there's over 30 years of research into the use of this in clinical circumstances. So work of people like Skip Rizzo, who's using virtual reality to help build resilience in people heading out on deployment, and those returning from war, uh, uh, veterans returning from deployment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Or even the work of Hoffman, who used virtual reality to reduce pain and distress in people having burns and dressing changes. Now, in the early 90s, this was tried and failed because the technology wasn't good enough. But the technology is now good and cheap. And so you can buy one of these. This is a Samsung Gear VR headset. It's about 100 pounds. It plugs into my smartphone. And I'm already using this with patients. The first time that I used this with patients was back in 2016 when a lady called Isabella came to see me. Now, I use technology on patients all the time. But in this case, this is a lady who'd just given birth, and she had a wound that needed daily dressing. And she was finding it very, very painful. And because she was breastfeeding, she wasn't able to take any medications for this. But I had my VR headset. I had my patient. And so we decided to just go for it. And it worked. This is the incredible thing. It worked. It significantly reduced the pain that she had. She went from a person that cried through the dressings to a person that actually laughed through the dressings. And on one occasion, we managed to finish the dressing without her even noticing. I mean, that's a massive win for a person that was finding it difficult to even come in. So since that point, I've adopted it with my other patients. And I use this most days for patients coming in for painful procedures, for things like joint injections, blood sampling, and wound care. And I've started to share what I've been doing online on a forum called VR Doctors, where people share their experiences and work on solutions for using immersive technology. And through sharing, I found that there are five principal ways in which virtual reality can be used. It's not just about making existing treatment more comfortable or effective, but it can act as a therapy in and of itself. So virtual reality can, in some cases, be almost twice as effective as using morphine. And in a situation where we're over-prescribing opioids, not only in the United States, but in the UK too, it's important that we find a way to deal with this without drugs. We can use it for diagnosis. You can play games to identify those early changes in your location sense, which can indicate dementia. For education and training, you have people like Shafi Ahmed. And in 2016, he did groundbreaking work in broadcasting a video of him undergoing an operation in 360 Live around the world. And with VR, you don't have to just step into Shafi's shoes. Shafi can step into a patient's shoes. And so you can start to understand the patient experience as being a recipient of care or maybe even having diseases himself. Or as a patient, looking to the future and understanding the consequences of your action. And it's that ability to immerse and adopt the perspective of someone else it leads to that ability to empathize with other people, spread an understanding of disease, or for people that are limited in hospice, in, ho in hospitals, to be able to travel outside. So virtual reality is already being used. I mean, I say this because I'm using it already, but it can also be used in three key areas coming up for acute pain, in mental health, and also education and training. Genomics is next. Now, this is a talk in and of itself. I'm not going to try and do any more than you've just done with this one. It's the study of the genes and the expression of the genome and how it works. Now, the only important point I want to say about this is about the tremendous reduction in cost of getting this done. So when the first genome was sequenced, it took several years, and it took, I think, $2.7 billion. And now a company called Illumina are proposing that soon they will be able to reduce that cost to less than $100 and do it in a matter of hours. Now, we're not quite at that point yet, but there's a company called 23andMe that maybe you've heard about. And my patients and I have sent saliva samples off and got some information back. So the sort of information you get back sometimes is kind of fun. So for example, I know my ancestry data. I know that I am 3.2% Neanderthal, which puts me into the 99th centile. And I think that's why I ate so much meat last night. <laughs> it tells me that I've got wet earwax. It tells me that I am a fast caffeine metabolizer, which is literally like winning a lottery ticket, because I can have two or three coffees after my meal at night and still sleep. 
but it also tells me something about my disease risks. So for example, it will tell me about my risk of Parkinson's disease, certain forms of dementia, risks of certain cancers. And this is important for patients to know. But the thing that's making a practical difference right now is pharmacogenomics, indications about a person's varied metabolism for drugs. So one example is warfarin. And there'll be some people in the room here, I'm sure, that will be taking warfarin, which is a common drug used to thin the blood. Now, you might want to do that to reduce your risk of stroke if you have an irregular heartbeat. People vary significantly about how they metabolize this. But with pharmacogenomics, you can understand beforehand and identify those people that might be more variable, give them different drug choices, or maybe monitor them more closely. And in my case, because of my increased coffee intake, I developed quite significant indigestion. And so I went to my own GP, and I was prescribed a common drug, omeprazole. The thing is, I'm an ultra-fast omeprazole and proton pump inhibitor metabolizer. And what that means is you can give me all those in the world, it wouldn't make any difference. Switched to a different drug, and it made a difference. Imagine that information plugged into my prescribing tools, reducing this kind of trial and error approach that we sometimes use. And finally, the Internet of Things. And again, I'm going to go for a simple description here. The Internet of Things is simply connecting everything up, connecting embedded computer hardware that's present in your fridge, in your home, in your car, or even in you. So there'll be people out here wearing Fitbits. I've seen plenty of Fitbits flashing. And you've almost certainly got a smartphone that's con collecting a lot of data about this. You've also got drugs like Proteus, which tells you whether you've taken a medication, Abstat, which monitors your gut activity. All this information is a constant stream of actionable data on a patient and patient care. And this torrent of data is coming in to GPs. And we're using artificial intelligence to try and interpret this. But the example I want to show you today, or one of the tools I want to show you today, is this. This device some of you may have, some of you have seen. It's a, an ECG. It's a smartphone ECG from a company called AliveCore or Cardia. And I use this several times every day with patients. And it gives a clinical grade, single lead ECG tracing for patients that come in to screen them from atrial fibrillation. Remember, I was telling you about the risk of stroke. But also patients that have irregular heartbeats. And I don't have to just do this in the practice. I can give this to them. They can take it home. And then if they go home and then they have a palpitation when they're at home, they can use this. It automatically gets uploaded to me and notifies me. So it's extending the reach outside the practice and into the community. So there's been four things I've mentioned. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, the genome, and the internet of things. But the really exciting things happen when you combine these. So with genomics, we're getting an awful lot of data. From the internet of things, we're getting an awful lot of data. By using artificial intelligence, we can turn this torrent of information, uh, data into actionable information. Or virtual reality, allowing us to visualize this data in new ways. If you go upstairs into the third floor, you'll see some people doing exactly that. Or virtual reality is a place where people can actually interact with virtual counselors, like in Skip Rizzo's Brave Mind for PTSD. And these tools are not just in the hand of clinicians. They're in the hands of patients. Patients who are saying, we are not waiting for you to catch up. We are doing this themselves. William Gibson, author, famously said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So it's my job, it's our job, to ensure that we distribute the future as evenly and widely as possible. Thank you very much.